Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for this beautiful time that you have so graciously given unto us. I pray that you would forgive us of our many sins and that you would cleanse us from the filth of our unrighteousness. We know that it is only the, the merits of Christ that can make the worship of sinful mortals acceptable to you. Father, I pray that you be with every person that is here under the sound of my voice. Lord, we all need to hear not only a word from heaven, but we need grace and strength so that we can actually obey that which you are going to communicate. I pray that you be with those who are, are in the valley of decision, for I know that there are even souls here tonight that know consciously that they have not surrendered their souls to heaven. But I pray, dearly Father, that they may be led into that decision to surrender all, because we know that tomorrow is not promised. As we are told in the book of Psalms that when we hear the voice of the Lord, that we are not to harden our hearts as in the day of provocation. And so I just pray that you would please keep us to this end. Please be with my mind. Please, the Lord, I pray that you would bring back to my remembrance everything that you have communicated to me and that nothing will be lost through my utterance. And I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Now, does everybody have their Bibles? Now, something that we really try to emphasize as much as possible is that the Bible is a precious document, the most precious document that God has given to us as human beings. And unfortunately, we do not prize this sacred volume as much as we should. Now, we're going to open up our Bibles to the book of Isaiah. We're going to open up our Bibles to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 60, and this is where our scripture reading, this is going to be the theme for this, for this entire week, Isaiah chapter 60. Isaiah chapter 60, and we're going to start in verse 1. Isaiah chapter 60, starting in verse 1. The Bible says, Arise, shine, for thy light is what? Come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. It says, For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the what? Now, without even going into our presentation, do we understand to some degree the fact that there is darkness covering this planet? Yes. Now, who here by show of hands really believes that Jesus is about to come back the second time? You see, unfortunately, because God is about to do something very momentous in the last stages of this generation, Satan is also determined to thwart the plans of God as it pertains to the plan of redemption. And so it says, In gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen, what? Upon thee. All right, now let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Luke. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Luke. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Luke. Now we're going to turn in our Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 21. Turn to Luke, chapter 21. And we're going to start in verse 5. Luke chapter 21, starting in verse 5. And when you have it, you can say amen. amen. The Bible says, And some spake of the temple, and as some spake of the temple, how it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts, he said, As for these things which ye behold, the days will come, in which there shall not be left one stone upon another, that shall not be thrown down. Now, in context, what was Jesus here speaking of? The destruction of Jerusalem. Now, when was Jerusalem destroyed? 70 AD. Now, who destroyed Jerusalem? Okay, Rome under which uh, general? Titus. Yes, Titus. In verse 7. 
The Bible says, and they asked him, saying, Master, but when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming? What shall be the sign be when these things shall come to pass? I was thinking of, uh, of Matthew. Verse 8, it says, and he said, take heed that ye be not what? I find it very interesting that in delineating the events to take place right before his second coming, the very first thing that Jesus warns his disciples against was what? Deception. You see, the reason why Jesus felt it so necessary to warn against deception, because in deception lies the power of Satan. Does that make sense? If Satan is going to be successful, he first has to deceive his subjects. Does that make sense? Now, do you think that Satan is inculcating deception in the world today? Do you think that this is leading to the gross darkness that is encapsulating the minds of individuals? All right. Now, in light of that, now, does anybody know what this is? This is a symbol of the, of the system of spirituality that is very prominent, especially with very many of our young people. Very many of our young people. Now, notice this. This says, medicine with a side of mysticism, top hospitals promote unproven therapies. We're living in a day and age where Satan is even trying to get the people of modern society to use mysticism in order to generate healing. Now, did the Bible say that these things would take place at the end of time? Yes, yes it did. Notice this, this says, yet hospitals affiliated with Yale, Duke, Johns Hopkins, now, are these uh, fringe hospitals? These are mainstream hospitals. And other top medical research centers also aggressively promote alternative therapies with little or no scientific backing. Now, this is not, uh, as it were, to berate the medical industry, but primarily who is behind modern medicine as we know it today. Because does drug medication really bring healing to the system? Because we know that any intelligent physician, if they understand the physiological effects that, uh, that uh, modern medicine has on the system, they will know that it is not to be entered into the body. All right, this says energy healing. We're not going to spend a tremendous amount of time going over these points. Now, has anybody ever heard of something called yoga? Yeah. Now, do you know that there are many Christians that are practicing yoga? Yeah. Now, remember, the reason why we're going over this, because this is a part of the system of darkness that Satan is using in order to encapsulate the entire world. Now, do you think that yoga practices are even in our seven-day Adventist institutions? Yes. yes, it is. Notice this. This says, how do yoga, meditation, breathing practices, and relaxation help us heal? Now, does, does the Bible talk about a certain system of meditation? Yes. Yes. Is there a biblical meditation? Yes. yes, there is. But everything that God has, Satan has a, a counterfeit. Notice. And this is also another point. I'm sorry I didn't mention this before. Brothers and sisters, we are in the sacred precincts of the Most High. And when the Word of God is being faithfully preached, it is very important that we not be distracted. And this is not a, as a means to attack anybody, but Satan will do everything that he can to ensure that we are not understanding what God is communicating. So please, with, with whatever cell phone you may have, Please either put it on silent or turn it off. Does that make sense? Amen. Amen. All right, so this is going to tell us about the purpose of yoga. Number one, they say that yoga is for what? Healing. Healing. Number two, they say it's for what? Personal gain. Number three, it's for what? Self-unfoldment. 
Now, the last time I checked, we're told in self steps to Christ that self is the enemy that we most need to fear. And number four, what is that right there? Enlightenment. Now, did Satan tell Adam and Eve that he would give them a system of enlightenment if they bit of the fruit? Yes, he did. Now, is everybody following this? Now, and we really try to emphasize this as we go from place to place. It is very essential for us to understand these things because you will be surprised how easy it is to be deceived by these things thinking that you're practicing the works of righteousness. Now, does anybody know what this is? This is the system of divinities that very many people are worshiping in this day and age. Now, this is a gentleman by the name of Dr. Strange. Anybody have heard of Dr. Strange? Now, what is insane about this, that this man literally practices overt witchcraft. And it was amazing. I was uh, on YouTube and there were even Christians that were defending watching these things and WandaVision and all of this occult nonsense believing that this was helping to develop their character. Think about this, that we can profess literally to be servants of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, while at the same time ingesting this and still believe that we're keeping the commandments of God. This is some of the highest levels of deception. This is taken from The Guardian. Now, is The Guardian a Christian outlet? No. No, it's not. This says, Black Magic Surgeon Dr. Strange brings the occult back to the big screen. Now, do you think that Satan is interested in initiating the general population into the occult? Yes. And it very well may be that even in some of our households, we have occult material in our households and we wonder why there's so much strife in our homes. This says, this week's release of the Marvel's latest, this is from a couple years ago, Dr. Strange brings magic sorcery and extra dimensional travel, most importantly, well-tailored robes into the comic book film universe. And it's amazing, years ago when I used to watch these things, I had no idea the subliminal messages that Satan was communicating through these mediums. But the whole point of Dr. Strange is that the, t the t titular uh, protagonist enlightens himself through what? Black magic. Black magic. The character rose to prominence just as the American counterculture was beginning to dabble in forms of spirituality outside the Judeo-Christian establishment. And it's amazing. Before this evening is over, we're actually going to find out that very many of us are practicing black magic and have no idea what we're really doing. You know, it's amazing. In the book of 1 Samuel, the prophet Samuel said that rebellion is as the sin of what? So do you have to be necessarily doing sorcery to be practicing witchcraft? No, you don't. Just be disobedient to the Lord. This says, unlike those films which were targeted at adults, Dr. Strange was and is for children. Selling a story about black magic to kids was no easy feat. I wonder if Disney is doing the same thing today. And we, and we thrust our grandchildren before the Lion King and Pocahontas teaching all of this spiritism and mesmerism and we're so confused as to why our little children want nothing to do with the principles of heaven. All right, we don't have time to go through all of this, but this says by the 1980s, Indiana Jones series uh, posited that pretty much every religious or occult myth was real. The Ark of the Covenant, the Holy Grail, Hinduism. So essentially what this is conveying is that modern movies are initiating people into the occult. Whether it be Star Wars, Indiana Jones, it doesn't matter what genre it is. All right, does anybody know what this is? Yeah. You know, it's amazing. Do you think that there are, are very many Christians who are Freemasons? Do you think that there are Seventh-day Adventists who are Freemasons? I remember uh, we were doing a series of meetings at a church, 
And we were talking about how, how God does not want us to be a part of these devilish organizations. And this was in a seven-day Adventist church. And a woman came up to me and she said that she was a part of an organization called the Eastern Star of Freemasonry. A seven-day Adventist, and the only reason why she was a part of this is because nobody ever told her that these things were wrong. Famous Freemasons. List of famous 33rd degree Freemasons. Now again, the reason why we are emphasizing this is because this is the system of darkness that, that Satan is seeking to inculcate in the world today. Does that make sense? All right, 33rd degree of Freemasonry is an honorary degree awarded by the Scottish Rite and a pendant Masonic order that typically bestows the 4th through 32nd degrees. Notice this, President Harry Truman was a 33rd degree Freemason. Now, I want to be very clear about this. This is taken from the Masons of what? This is not a conspiracy theory outlet. This is literally from their own website. Now, who was Harry Truman? Harry S. Truman. President. Now, Harry S. Truman, uh, whether or not we knew this, he was the president responsible for dropping the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I wonder if there was a correlation. I wonder. FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover, who was also a closet homosexual, Michigan Supreme Court Justice George E. Bunchell, businessman Henry Watt, Ford. Henry Ford, who was actually responsible for giving much equipment to Nazi Germany that actually helped to propagate the devastation of the Third Reich. Golfer Arnold Palmer, astronaut Jen Glenn Jr., civil rights activist Medgar Evers, and all of these different persons. Now, does anybody know who this man was? A man by the name of Albert Pike. Now, is everybody following this? I don't want to lose anybody. This is a man by the name of Albert Pike. He was a 33rd degree Freemason, and he wrote a book called Morals and Dogma, which is essentially the Bible of Freemasonry. This says, that which we must say to the crowd is, now what this man is actually saying He's uh, telling a person what we are going to tell the public that we worship. Does that make sense? That which we must say to the crowd is, we worship a what? A God. A God. So when celebrities get up and they thank God for all of his blessings, are they thanking the God of heaven? When Beyonce and Jay-Z and all of these people say that God is blessing them with all of these things, is it the God of heaven? It is the God of this world. But it is the God one adores without superstition. Notice, this says the Masonic religion should be by all of us initiates of the high degrees maintained in the purity of the Luciferian doctrine. Notice, if Lucifer were not God, would Adonai, the God of the Christians, notice what they say about the God of heaven, whose deeds prove his cruelty, perfidy, and hatred of man, barbarism, and repulsion for science. Would Adonai and his priests culminate him? Yes, Lucifer is what? So who do the Freemasons worship? They worship Satan. And unfortunately, Adonai is also what? Because according to occult science, you need both good and evil. Now, let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Isaiah. Let's turn in our Bibles back to the book of Isaiah. Let's turn in our Bibles back to the book of Isaiah. You see, because this whole concept of mixing light with darkness is not a new phenomenon nor ideology. This is something that Satan has been doing for a very long period of time. So Isaiah chapter 5, and we're going to start in verse 20. Start in verse 20. Notice what the Bible says. 
Woe unto them that call evil good and good what? So were ancient pagan uh, civilizations doing this in bygone times? Yes, they were. That put darkness for light and light for what? And light for darkness. That put bitter for sweet and sweet for what? So is it a snare to mix light with darkness? Now, you see, we can actually be mixing light with darkness when we decide to cherry pick principles of the word of God. You know, and so many times I come in contact with persons who will take some passages of the Bible and even the spirit of prophecy and will say that they believe in these passages, but they will not believe in other passages. Brothers and sisters, we need the whole counsel of God. We need the whole counsel of God. Now, we're not going to spend too much time on this point. This says darkness being necessary for light to serve as its foil as the pedestal is necessary to the statue and the brake to the locomotive. This says, thus the doctrine of Satanism is what? So they, they don't call themselves Satanists, they call themselves Luciferians, but sadly they are all deceived. And the true and pure philosophical religion is the belief in Lucifer, the equal of what? Let's turn in our Bibles. We're already in Isaiah. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 14. Because what did Satan say in Isaiah chapter 14? Isaiah chapter 14, we're going to start in verse 12. This is the doctrine of Lucifer, the doctrine of Satan. Verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the what? The son of the morning. How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into where? Heaven. Into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the what? North. Of the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the what? Most high. Brothers and sisters, just notice the level of psychoticness that you have to be under to literally be a created being and literally think that you can be like the Most High. To know that the God of heaven created you while at the same time still trying to dethrone him. This is what sin does to the imagination. This says, but Lucifer, God of light and God of good, is struggling for humanity against Adonai, the God of darkness and evil. Satan is literally trying to make us believe as human beings that God hates us and that Satan really loves us. And just think about this. In light of everything that our Lord and Savior has done for us, Jesus literally stuffed himself into a human body. Literally came and lived a sinless life. Did all of this for us, but we so zealously serve Satan as if he did anything for our betterment. Now, does anybody know who this man was? It's a man by the name of Manly Palmer Hall. He was another 33rd degree Freemason. Notice what the man says. The most dangerous form of what? Did we just talk about black magic? Yes. All right. Is the scientific perversion of occult power for the gratification of what? Notice what the man says. Its less complex and more universal form is human what? So if you are selfish, you are practicing black magic. If you are selfish, then you are practicing black magic. Brothers and sisters, we don't have to be wearing pentagrams. We don't have to be doing human sacrifices. We don't have to be drinking the blood of bulls and goats in order to be serving Satan. If we just choose not to do what God in love asks us to do, then we are practicing black magic. Does that make sense? 
This says a man will barter his eternal soul for temporal power and down through the ages a mysterious process has been evolved which actually enables him to make this exchange. Do you think that men are doing this today? In its various branches, the black art includes nearly all forms of ceremonial magic. We're going to jump down. Under the general heading are also included mesmerism and hypnotism, except when used solely for medical purposes. Though the demonism of the Middle Ages seems to have disappeared, there is abundant evidence that in many forms of modern thought, notice what, he's, uh, what he specifically pinpoints, especially the so-called prosperity psychology, or in other words, prosperity gospel. Does that make sense? Willpower building metaphysics and systems of high pressure salesmanship. The mysteries were therefore established for the purpose of unfolding the nature of man according to certain fixed rules, which when faithfully followed, elevated the human what? This was the same thing that Satan told Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, that if you partake of the fruit, that your consciousness is going to be elevated. Does that make sense? All right. To a point where it was capable of cognizing its own constitution and the true purpose of its what? And the true purpose of its existence. Does anybody know who this woman was? Now, I know that we're going over a lot of information, but it is critically essential that we understand the mechanisms of what Satan is doing in order to inculcate this darkness into the world today. Now, this was a woman by the name of Alice A. Bailey. Alice A. Bailey. This was essentially Satan's version of Sister White. Notice what the woman said. There is no question, therefore, that the work to be done in familiarizing the general public with the nature of the mysteries is of paramount importance at this time. This is the reason why all of this occultism is so prevalent in the world today. I mean, we literally have so many of our young people, even young people in the church, getting their entire bodies tattooed, engaging in all of this necromancy and spiritism, not realizing that Satan is literally initiating them into demonism and the occult. Brothers and sisters, do you think that we need to pray for our young people? Yes, yes we do. Now, does anybody know what this is? This is the greatest mechanism that Satan is using to encapsulate the entire world in the gross darkness that we just read in the book of Isaiah. Anybody know what this is? It starts with an E. This is a symbol of something called education. Brothers and sisters, I don't know how much I can emphasize this. We need to be especially careful with what we are ingesting into our minds. We need to be careful of the type of education that we are giving our children. And I don't mean just public schools because even many institutions that profess to be Christian is nothing more than pagan education with a Christian badge attached to it. Notice this. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Revelation. And you see, dear friends, the reason why it is so essential to speak this plain is because we are at the end of time. Satan is not playing games. And if we are not dead serious about our salvation, we are going to be swept away with the current. Revelation chapter 13. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13, we're going to start in verse 1. Revelation chapter 13, starting in verse 1. We're making good time. It says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, 
and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of what? Notice the nature of this beast. Notice. And the beast which I saw was like unto a what? And his feet were as the feet of a bear and his mouth uh, as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So of this beast in Revelation, what was the largest component of this beast? The leopard. Now, this particular imagery, what uh, chapter of the Bible does this remind you of? Daniel Daniel chapter 7. Yes, Daniel chapter 7. Now, who did the leopard represent? Greece. Now, what has Greece handed down to us through the generations? It's education. Does that make sense? Anybody know who this man was? This was one of the most brilliant educational minds that God ever gave to the Seventh-day Adventist movement. A man by the name of E.A. Sutherland. I would highly recommend getting his book called Living Fountains or Broken Cisterns. Notice what this man said. Yes? Yes, E.A. Sutherland. E.A. Sutherland. Notice what the man said. We're going to take our time with this. In order to understand the fertility of the seeds of pagan education, it is necessary to regard with care the mastermind of that system. And this we find in what? So according to this historical fact, Plato is the father of modern education. Does that make sense? All right. Does anybody know who this man was? A 19th century uh, historian, a man by the name of Ralph Emerson. Ralph Emerson. Notice what the man said. Plato is what? Philosophy. And philosophy Plato. At once the glory and shame of mankind, since neither Saxon nor Roman have availed to add any idea to his categories. No wife, no children had he. So he was completely celibate. I wonder where the Catholic Church gets that idea from. And the thinkers of all civilized nations are his posterity and are tinged with his mind. How many great men nature is uh, incessantly sending up out of night to be his men? Platonists. Mohammedanism. Now, does anybody know what that means? Mohammedanism. This is talking about Islam. Mohammedanism draws all its philosophy and its handbook of morals from him, speaking of Plato. So, according to Emerson, Islam literally gets its ideology from the philosopher Plato. This citizen of a town in Greece is no villager nor patriot. We're going to skip this. As our Jewish Bible has implanted itself in the table talk and household life of every man and woman in the European and American nations, so the writings of Plato have preoccupied every school of learning, every lover of thought, every church, every poet, making it impossible to think on certain levels except through him. So do you get the point? So this is saying that Plato is literally the father of modern pagan education. Notice, going down to the very bottom, it says, this is defining philosophy. Philosophy is the account which the human mind gives to itself of the constitution of the world. So essentially what Plato was trying to do, he was trying to explain the mechanisms of the universe by his depraved imagination. Does that make sense? And this is what modern philosophy is based on. All right. Keep that in mind. Again, notice E.A. Sutherland and again. Now let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Hebrews. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Hebrews chapter 11. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Hebrews chapter 11. 
Hebrews chapter 11, and we're going to start in verse 3. Hebrews 11, verse 3. Notice what the Word of God says in Hebrews chapter 11, starting in verse 3. It says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do what? So the Bible is saying is that God created the worlds literally out of nothing. This is the creative power of God. But notice, but Platonism is the mind trying to account to itself for the constitution of the world. Notice, how think you did the author of this philosophy go about to account for the things which can be grasped by faith alone? Can you really explain creation? No, you cannot. It is a mystery. And we're actually going to get into that tomorrow. To Plato belongs the honor of first subjecting education to a scientific examination. Here began the laboratory studies which have been continued by Huxley, Darwin, and others. Now, does anybody know who those persons were? Yes. Notice what he goes on to say. And thus from Plato, Europe, and America have gained their ideas of evolution. So evolution is merely a modern reiteration of the philosophy of Plato. That's all it is. And this is why persons must understand that evolution is literally a religion. It is literally a religion. All right, does anybody know who this man was? Now, friends, I know that we are going over a lot of information. By show of hands, who is following? By show of hands. You see, because... One of the things that we really try to emphasize, by the grace of God, I'm really going to try not to preach too much. It is really important that we understand these things in detail. So I'm going to try to systematically go through this as much as I possibly can. All right. Notice what A.T. Jones says. Now, remember, we're talking about gross darkness. This is what Satan is doing in order to blind the minds of human beings. And what did this education? So he's saying essentially, what did the system of pagan education do for Greece and Rome? Notice, the literature, the art, the physical culture, and all it produced do for the Roman people when adopted. Deep dyed was the iniquity of Rome. Greece and Rome perished so entirely that no part remained. Annihilation being the result of Greek education. So what is the final result of pagan or Greek education? Annihilation. So if we are following the same system of education, if we are teaching the same system of education in our institutions, what is going to be the end result? It's going to be annihilation. And Satan deceives us into believing that because we have a PhD that we've attained something. That because we have a master's, even in divinity, that we've actually attained something. I mean, even the concept of that is, is literally psychotic. How in the world can you be a master of divinity? That literally makes no sense. What else then uh, this can possibly be the result in a society or a nation which in education adopts the method which is Greek? This is why God intrinsically gave us as Seventh-day Adventists a different system of education. And it wasn't just Seventh-day Adventists. Around the turn of the 1840s, there were different bodies of Christians that were following proper principles of education. Has anybody ever heard of a man by the name of Booker T. Washington? Booker T. Washington, he knew and understood that the education that was most profitable for the upliftment of black people in this nation was an education that addressed the physical, the spiritual, and the mental nature of man. An education that only deals with the mental is false education. All right. 
Now, in light of all of this paganism that Satan is propagating in the world today, what do you think would naturally be the result of the people that would follow that system of education? Now, let's turn in our Bibles. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of 2 Timothy. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of 2 Timothy. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of 2 Timothy. And we're going to seek to bring this message to a close. Let's turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Brothers and sisters, studying the Word of God, it is so enriching. It is so enriching. 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting in verse 1. The Bible says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall what? Now, are we currently living in the last days? Yes. yes. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Now, why do you think the children are being disobedient to their parents? Yes, because of their education. Unfortunately, the parents are not training the children properly. One of the great reasons why the children of Israel kept falling into apostasy was because the parents in Israel were not training the next generation. Unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, incontinent fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of what? Having a form of godliness, but denying their power thereof, from such have close fellowship. No. Turn, away. Turn away. Turn away. Does anybody know what this is? And, and I don't seek to be facetious, but some persons call this the alphabet community. Now, does any of us have friends or family that are a part of this community? Brothers and sisters, do you think that the persons in these communities, do you think that they need our fervent prayers? You see, when we see people dominated by the devices of Satan, it should awaken in our heart a, dip, a, a deeper sympathy and empathy for them. Now, don't get me wrong. Is this lifestyle abominable? Yes. Are those who are openly practicing this who do not repent, is heaven going to be their home? No, no it is not. But by the grace of God, as we're told in the book of Psalms, that it is God's goodness that leads us to repentance. I found this article from USA Today. This was actually written by a Christian pastor. Notice this insanity. Generation Z is driving force among adults, identifying as LGBTQ. Actually, this is not it. We're going to get to it. Notice this statistic. Of Generation Z, almost 20% of Generation Z identifies as a part of the LGBT community. 20%. And this is of the people that were surveyed. This is not talking about the young people that are experimenting with same-sex relations. And again, friends, we are deceiving ourselves into believing that there are not many of our young people, even in our church, that are practicing these things. Literally fornicating almost as it were in the very house of God. The very house of God. Does anybody know who this woman was or is? Mississippi woman, 19, filmed herself having sex with a male dog. We're getting to the point where the same bestial practices of pagan nations are now being inculcated in society. I was actually watching something called TED Talk. Has anybody ever heard of TED Talk? And in TED Talk, it was mentioning this woman was trying to say that pedophilia is a legitimate sexual orientation. And that those who love little children, that they need our sympathy. They need our love and affection because they can't help their desires. We're going to skip past this. Anybody know who this man is? Yes. 
This is the Dalai Lama. Dalai Lama apologizes for asking a young boy to suck his tongue. Lord have mercy. If this man is doing this in public, only the Lord knows what this man is doing in private. And this is something that we must understand. The vast, the many people, I won't say the vast, but many persons in these upper echelons of society are practicing these things. We are deceiving ourselves if we think that these rich and powerful persons are not directly in league with these things. The Bible literally says that there is spiritual wickedness in high places, high places. We're going to skip past this. This is a woman in a high position. This woman, this woman was a police union chief who was literally smuggling drugs in from overseas. We're going to skip past this. Remember, all of this is the practical outworking of the education that Satan is inculcating in society. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. Anybody know what this is? This is a symbol of a country called Russia. Now, currently, we are in a proxy war with Russia as the United States. We are giving billions of dollars over to Ukraine in order to destroy the Russian nation. Does anybody know why the United States has such a vested interest in this war in the Ukraine? What does the Bible say is the root of all evil? The only reason why we are sending money to the Ukraine is because Russia has a lot of natural gas and a lot of oil. That is the only reason. When we watch CNN and Fox News and all of this, when we watch Anderson Cooper or Tucker Carlson, and we genuinely believe that these persons are giving us the truthful accounts of what is taking place in the world. It's nothing more than propaganda. Anybody know who this man was? A man by the name of Anthony C. Sutton. He says Russia, now this man was not a conspiracy theorist. This man was a research fellow at the Hoover Institute. Russia was then and is today the largest untapped market in the what? World. In the world. Moreover, Russia then and now constituted the greatest potential competitive threat to American industrial and what? What is that word? Financial. Financial supremacy. You see, because the Bible says that eventually the United States is going to have such a stranglehold upon the world's economy that it is going to make the entire world bow down and worship the papacy. Does everybody remember that? Yes. All right. A glance at a world map is sufficient to spotlight the geographical difference between the vast landmass of Russia and the smaller United States. Wall Street must have cold shivers when it visualizes Russia as a second super American industrial giant. All right. We're bringing this message to a close. Now, does anybody know what this is? Has anybody ever heard of a pastor by the name of Michael Todd? He's the lead pastor of a church called Transformation Church. And this Mind you, this was not a picture from the Grammys. This was not from the VMAs, but this was the Easter program that they put on at the Transformation Church, where they literally have a woman crucified in the back and these demons running around doing all of this nonsense. And the man literally said that people were being brought to Christ as a result of this wickedness. Notice this. You see, and the reason why we're bringing this out is there are many loving, God-fearing Christians who are watching this genuinely thinking that this is propagating the gospel. The shocking transformation of Michael Todd's Easter service. All right. This says the clips of the play have been circulating across social media. This says... Notice what, this is what Michael Todd said verbatim. He envisioned that the play should speak to the lost instead of just, to those who are, who, 
already were saved, saying that he wanted to go to the edge and to do everything short of sin with the plague. So essentially, let's go to the, the brink of the precipice without actually going over. Today, with an amazing team under the direction of some amazing people, I believe for the first time we're going to get to see this production with the level of anointing. Now, do you think that the Holy Spirit was anointing this service? No, it wasn't. Anybody know who this is? I'm smiling, but it's not funny. This is the lead pastor of the Transformation Church. Now notice the blasphemy coming from this man's lips. And the saddest part is when confronted with the reality of this, these men will go from sea to shining sea in order to defend their positions. Notice. Transformation Church pastor compares Jesus to a naked stripper. Notice. In a recent sermon, Ross makes some grotesque claims. In his sermon, Pastor Ross brazenly likens money to bread, equating it to the biblical miracle of manna. This outlandish analogy insinuates that financial abundance is nothing less than a divine entitlement. Now, these are the words of uh, Tim Ross himself. But you know that the enemy's a counterfeit, right? He ain't the first one to make it rain. Literally, he's not the first one to make it rain. I would take you to Genesis to prove to you who the first person was that made it rain. But scripture said that manna came from heaven and it was bread to them. We don't make it rain on booty. Lord have mercy. The fact that this man would even say this from the pulpit. We don't make it rain on strippers. We only reverence one stripper. To literally equate the sovereign God of the universe to a stripper. God have mercy on this man's soul. And that's the one that took off glory to put on humanity and then get butt naked on a cross to die for both you and me. Literally, may God have mercy on this man's soul. Anybody know what this is? This is a very popular television program that very many of us as Christians love to partake in. Has anybody ever heard of an outlet called Little Light Studios? They just put out a powerful documentary on this particular program. Now, should, should we as Christians be watching any type of theatrical programs? No, we shouldn't. You see, theater intrinsically is lying. Intrinsically, it is deception. The Chosen. Now, does anybody know what is the religion of the man who plays Jesus in The Chosen? Catholic. He's a Roman Catholic. So what type of Jesus do you think he is propagating on the television screen? The Jesus of the Bible or the Jesus of Roman Catholicism? Yeah. Well, somebody says, you know what, Brother Samuel, you're taking things to extremes. How in the world can you bash this when so many people are coming to know Jesus through this instrumentality. Now, Jesus told us very clearly that at the end of time, that there are going to be very many persons who will say, Lord, did not I prophesy in your name? Lord, did not I do all of these wondrous works? And Jesus is literally going to say, not that I don't know you, but that I never knew you. I never knew you. We never had a relationship. Now, this is taken from one of the men who are the executive producers of The Chosen, who happens to be a Mormon. Now, this was in a book that he wrote called The YouTube Formula. Another project Jeffrey Harmon and I are currently working on together is the popular opposite of a pooping unicorn. It is Jesus. 
Notice the purpose of the chosen according to the executive producers. We wanted to create a TV series about the life of Jesus Christ that appealed to the evangelical community. Notice at the bottom, we knew we wanted to resonate our message and vision with a specific persona. Notice, 25 to 45 year old female married or unmarried church goer volunteer. So they specifically knew that if they were going to make this television program popular, that it needed to appeal to women between the ages of 25 to 45. Now, what was the first episode of The Chosen? It was highlighting the experiences of Mary Magdalene. Do you think that was by accident? It was all for profit revenue. How the chosen is unifying people of different faiths. So they're literally talking about how Jews and Catholics and atheists are coming together around the chosen. All right. We're going to skip past this. This is an article from an outlet called the National Catholic Register. Notice, The Chosen is a new and promising TV series on the life of Christ. Now, this is a Catholic outlet. Now, we're bringing this message to a close. According to the uh, Catholic Church, The Chosen is an Ignatian meditation on the Gospels. So essentially, when you watch The Chosen, you're being initiated into Jesuit spirituality. Does that make sense? Going on, this says at the bottom, this dialogue is interestingly inverted during the wedding in Cana. When Mary uh, asks Jesus to help with the wine, he replies, Mother, my time is not yet come. We're going to jump uh, to the, the very top again. At the same time, I'm glad it hasn't been suggested that they had other children. This says um, it begins with the events. Actually, right here it says, and to my eyes, there is a profound representation of Mary's intercessory role in episode five. Now, is Mary our intercessor? Who is our intercessor? Now, the Bible makes it very clear that there is only one intercessor between God and man, and that is the man Christ Jesus. All right, we don't have time to go through all this. A man by the name of Tupper Saucy, he wrote a book called The Rulers of Evil. He talks about the Ratio Sidorium, talks about Jesuit theater. Notice what this man said. The faculty of Munich College praised the way Jesuit, the Jesuit theater captivated Protestants. You see, the reality is, is that modern theater literally comes from the Catholic Church. We don't have time to go through all that history. This is what the Catholic priests said themselves. There is no better means of making friends out of the heretics. So according to the Catholics, you are a heretic. And the enemies of the church and filling up the enrollment of the school than good high-spirited play acting. Anybody know who this man was? Now I know we're going over a lot of history. I know we're going over a lot of history. A man by the name of Charles Spurgeon. Notice what the man says. A time will come when instead of shepherds feeding the sheep, the church will have clowns entertaining the goats. Do you think that we currently live in that day and age today? That we have so many people in the church that just want to be entertained. And, and literally, it literally, as it were, brings tears to your eyes when you think about the fact that the vast majority of people are literally just in the church making their way just to go to hell. Brothers and sisters, one of the things I pray that is really emphasized as we go through this week is the fact that we cannot play with our eternal salvation. We have to make our calling and election Sure. Whatever God tells us to do, we have to be willing to do it. 
God has done too much for us. You see, we have gotten to the point that God has demonstrated his love for us so much that we should have no misgivings about being obedient to him. We should not be asking why Lord anymore. Jesus dying on the cross was enough in order to answer the why. Great controversy. Popular revivals are too often carried by appeals to the imagination by exciting the emotions, by gratifying the love for that which is new and startling. Converts thus gained have little desire to listen to Bible truth. So many persons are watching The Chosen and all of these different Christian entertainments, but nobody has a desire to study the Bible. I mean, we struggle to spend even 10 minutes in prayer. We struggle to read the Bible for 15 minutes without falling asleep while at the same time we're literally convincing ourselves to make us believe that we really love Jesus because think about this if we are struggling to spend time with Jesus now what makes us think we're going to enjoy spending the rest of eternity with him in heaven what makes us think this the plain warnings of God's word relating directly to their eternal interests are unheeded. This is our very last slide. We're just going to go through a couple passages. Now, this is taken from first selected messages. There is nothing that Satan fears, what? So much as that the people of God shall clear the way by removing every what? Now, when this says hindrance, do you think that this is talking about a speed bump when you drive down the road? No. This is talking about what? This is talking about sin. So that the Lord can pour out his spirit upon a languishing church and an impenitent congregation. If Satan had his way, there would never be another awakening, great or small, to the end of time. It is possible to resist his power. Wicked men and devils cannot hinder the work of God. If they will, God's people with subdued, contrite hearts, confess and put away their sins and in faith claim his what? Satan may be successfully what? Resisted. Brothers and sisters, by show of hands, who here wants to resist the devices of Satan? My dear brothers and sisters, as we go through this, these next couple of days, in order for God to do in our lives what he truly desires to do, this evening, we need to go home and we need to pray, Lord, please reveal to me whatever may be in my life that would hinder me from receiving the outpouring of your Holy Spirit. If there has been strife in our families, there needs to be confession and there needs to be repentance. If we have been watching things on television that we know we should not be watching, we need to discard with those things today. Because God cannot bless us while we are hanging on to sin. And it doesn't matter what the sin is. And this is another deception. We're going to get into this tomorrow. Satan makes us believe that because we have been indulging in sin for an extended period of time that we cannot overcome. But that in and of itself is a deception. The Bible says that where God, where sin abounds, that God's grace, it doesn't just abound, but it much more abounds. So in light of that, let us have a word of prayer as we close out this session. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, I pray in a very special way that you would please forgive us of our sins. Lord, we have talked about very much tonight, and I pray that you would have mercy upon us for where we have engaged in any of this, the entertainments, the deceptions, the false 
tenets of Christianity, the Lord, we just pray that you would cleanse us from us, cleanse this from us. Lord, you desire for us to have abundant life, but we cannot have this while hanging on to unrighteousness. And again, by just show of hands, anyone here who wants this in their life, just raise your hand wherever you are. Dear Father, you see the raised hands, and I pray a special prayer for our families. Dear Lord, our families are hurting. And I just pray in a very special way that you will bring healing and restoration. Lord, because the darkness is especially amongst us, and I just pray that you would lift this, this satanic oppression that Satan has been seeking to inculcate. Lord, I plead the blood of Christ upon everyone under the sound of my voice. The spirit of life is here. It is, it is, it is present to heal. And I just pray, dear Lord, that you would help us to take advantage of these opportunities. Lord, I pray that you would be with us as we go through the rest of our time here this week. I pray that we will have attentive minds and hearts. And I pray that you would bring us again here tomorrow evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.